Welcome to Bed Crime Stories Podcast. I'm your host, T. Hi there, bed crimers. Hope you're all doing well. To anyone new here, a warm welcome. Thank you for checking out the channel. Do me a favor, if you find you enjoyed this content or learned something, smash that like button and consider subscribing. Now let's dig in. I do hope you're all doing really well. Today I want to further color in the lines of our portrait of Wendy Adelson. I turn now to information shared by a friend of hers named Tamara Demko. Tamara first became friends with Wendy's ex-husband, Danny Markell. They met while attending Harvard Law School. Later, when Danny and Wendy moved to Tallahassee, and Tamara was also living there, Tamara and Wendy became friends. Tamara is, surprisingly, both a lawyer, although she only does pro bono work, and a nurse, very bright cookie. Now, she was interviewed by the Tallahassee police back in 2014 on the day after Danny Markell was injured, July 19th. July 19th also tragically turned out to be the day that Danny succumbed to his injuries. This poor man suffered for 12 hours before he died. Tamara was eager to chat with the cops that day because she had noticed Wendy Adelson acting strangely and saying disturbing things both prior to Wendy's marriage to Danny and prior to his murder. So now I'm going to share highlights from what Tamara told the authorities that day after the crime occurred. I'm also going to share some of the things that Tamara said a year ago when she was a guest on the YouTube show, Surviving the Survivor. So that would have been nine years after her initial interview with the police. The nine years in between the interviews have in some ways changed Demko's perspective. With that background information shared, let's begin. Back in July of 2014, the first thing Tamara mentions in her police interview is the novel that Wendy wrote, a novel that many believe is based on her own life experiences in Tallahassee and in her marriage to Danny Markell. Note that Danny was seven years older than Wendy. They met when he was 33 and she was 26. When Wendy gave Tamara a copy of her novel, Tamara was surprised to see that Wendy only mentioned her two sons in the dedication. Her Tamara, it read, the author lives with her two sons in Tallahassee or something to that effect. At the time, Wendy and Danny were still married and living together in the house on Trescott Drive. So naturally, Tamara found the dedication both upsetting and revealing. In her more recent interview in 2022 on Surviving the Survivor, Demko stated that Wendy told her back in 2006 that she was having second thoughts about marrying Danny roughly one month prior to the scheduled big event. Thus, Demko now has concluded that the marriage was doomed right from the beginning. Her Tamara, it was Wendy's mother, Donna Adelson, who actually picked out Danny Markell on the Jewish dating website, J-Date. Tamara believes that perhaps wanting to please her parents and go with a guy that they felt was perfect for her, on paper at least, married Danny despite her own misgivings and what she herself has said was a man for whom she lacked passion. I'm also thinking that this may be indicative of what Wendy's ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacoste, said, which was that Wendy had a proclivity for asking for advice about things a teenager might. Could it be that Wendy grew up not having any confidence in her own ability to make sound decisions? And could that be the result of having a domineering, overly involved mother like Donna? Did Donna create a well-educated daughter who, despite her academic success, had little to no confidence in herself? A lot of people think Donna Adelson is a narcissist, and narcissistic mothers from what I've read, tend to rear children who are constantly striving to please their parents and striving for a perfection that is unattainable. All of this tends to make them very anxious people. 
Back in her 2014 interview with the police, Tamara told the investigator that Wendy left Danny right around his 40th birthday, and Tamara confirmed that Wendy failed to tell him where she and their two sons were staying for weeks. By the way, when Wendy testified during Katie McBanawa's trial, this is how she described her leaving Danny while he was away at a conference in New York. Fast forward now to September 10th, 2012. Professor Markell, he's away on a business trip, right? Yes. He's in New York City at New York University, right? I believe so, yes. And he's doing a presentation. I, I don't know what he was doing. Your husband at the time was in New York to give a presentation. You knew that, right? I knew he was in New York. I didn't know if he was attending a conference or giving a presentation, but he was in New York for work. Now, you had not communicated with him for two days. I really don't remember. You text him at around 2.30 in the afternoon, right? Right before he's about to do the presentation. I really don't remember. But you do remember dropping the bomb on him, don't you? Telling him that you wanted a divorce. So I did not drop a bomb on him. We'd been in therapy for several months beforehand where I told him several times I wanted a divorce. You say it's not a bomb, but you agree with me that he begged you to reconsider. He was very upset and, yes, wanted me to reconsider, but... In that phone call, he's begging you to reconsider. Please don't leave. Please don't break up our family, right? He was very upset, yes. And he was heartbroken. I mean, upset indicates that there was anger. What he was was heartbroken, right? That I decided to divorce him after telling him I would, yes. Despite being at NYU for a presentation, he rushes home. He gets on the next flight, right? I honestly don't remember if he got on the next flight, but he did come home quickly. 2.30, he finds out in New York. By 11 p.m., he's walking in the door to your old house at Trescott Drive, right? I don't know. But you do know that when he walks in the house, what he finds. You know that, right? Yes, I left him the papers. You left the divorce papers on the bed, right? Yes. Half the furniture was gone. Half the furniture was not gone. A good amount of his stuff was gone. Nothing of his was gone. The boy's stuff was gone, right? Some of the boys' things were gone. I'd taken enough so that I had for the boys, but no. You were gone? I, I was gone, yes. And so were his boys? Um, his boys were not gone. He saw them the next day, and they would not have been awake if he's coming home at 11 p.m. Let, let's, let's stay on topic here. When he, walks on topic. In the, when he walks in the door, the boys are not in the house, right? Correct. And you did not tell Professor Markell where you were taking the boys? He may have seen him the next day, but you did not let him know where you were going to be staying with his boys. With our boys? Yes. So you agree with me that they're also his? Of course they're his. And he should be entitled to know where his wife is taking his children? Absolutely. That's not all you took, is it? Excuse me? You two had a joint checking account at Schwab, right? We did. And you went into that account before you dropped the bomb. And you took out half of that account, right? Correct. Roughly $350,000. Half, yes. I'm sorry I let that go on a little too long, but I can't stop watching this. This lawyer is amazing. And Wendy Adelson is fascinating. Her ability to spin a fib is, in my opinion, quite well honed. She spins the story like, well, he saw his kids the next day, and they would have been sleeping anyway by the time he got home. He might have seen them, but he didn't know where they were staying. She didn't bother to tell him for several weeks. Ruth Markell, Danny's mother, has said that Danny called this horrible experience his Pearl Harbor because it was like having a bomb dropped. Danny suddenly found himself in a mostly empty house without his wife and without his little boys. And although Danny and Wendy had been in marriage counseling, Danny was still optimistic about things at this point. He truly was gobsmacked when she up and left him and left his house half empty, his bank account half empty, and his kids completely gone. And by the way, another friend of Wendy and Danny's, a guy named Jeremy Cohen, confirmed that Wendy did take much of the furniture. He noticed this when Danny had him and other friends over for his 40th birthday party, right after his Pearl Harbor Day. Danny, despite his sadness over the breakup of his marriage, 
threw himself a birthday party, and Jeremy Cohen noticed that much of the furniture was gone. And Tamara Demko added that Danny had to spend around $10,000 refurnishing the house to make it livable. So although Wendy denied emptying the home of its contents while testifying, she was not being 100% truthful. Again, she's very skilled at spinning her truth. By the way, Jeremy Cohen also described Wendy as being someone who could be out with Danny on a double date with him and his wife, and she could be smiling, and acting like everything was wonderful and copacetic, but behind Danny's back, she would have just told Jeremy's wife that the marriage was crumbling and in trouble. So Wendy has the ability to present herself as perfectly happy when on the inside, she's anything but. And I do recall Wendy's convicted brother, Charlie Adelson, saying to his mother, Donna, that Wendy has trouble confronting issues directly with other people. And I also recall Ruth Markell saying that Wendy presented herself as a very warm and friendly person when they first met her. Back to what Tamara Demko said in her 2014 interview with the police. She also told them that when Wendy filed her motion to relocate to South Florida with her and Danny's sons, Danny made it very difficult. Demko is the person who told the cops about the injunction that Danny got that prevented Wendy from making the move to be closer to her parents in South Florida. And it sounds like once Danny saw there was no hope of a reconciliation with Wendy, he went into fighting mode. And it sounds like Danny became obsessed with filing motions against Wendy. And he was even once scolded by the judge for filing a 23-page motion. Danny loved to debate. That was a core part of his personality. And in law school, you learn how to argue from the greats. Tamara said that the injunction shuffled the divorce into an even more bitter phase. Per Tamara, Wendy did feel trapped in Tallahassee. Demko also confirmed that Wendy had taken some of Danny's uncle's family heirloom jewelry and she refused to give it back. This included a two-carat Holocaust diamond that the uncle's wife had managed to escape Nazi Germany with. And by the way, per Danny's mother Ruth, Wendy still has these jewels to this day. Wendy, give the jewelry back to Ruth and Phil Markell. It's the least you can do at this point. Demko said in 2014 that she came to realize Wendy didn't love Danny, but Tamara didn't have the heart to tell Danny. Tamara also brought up Wendy's boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacoste, in that 2014 interview. Tamara said that as late as June of 2014, Wendy was still raving about what a great guy Lacoste was. But later in July, After Danny's death, when Tamara attended his memorial, she asked Wendy why her boyfriend wasn't there supporting her. Wendy replied that there is no boyfriend. So within a month, Wendy went from singing Lacasse's praises to saying that she no longer had a boyfriend. It's like she just ghosted him out of her life. It sort of looks like Lacasse in Wendy's mind had served his purpose at this point. And when that was over, she jettisoned him. I wonder if Wendy ever had genuine feelings for Jeff Lacoste or for anyone else for that matter. Tamara in 2014 also told the cops that Danny's new girlfriend, Amy Adler, also had strange feelings about who might have arranged for Danny's death. Amy was even afraid to travel to Tallahassee for the memorial. Tamara also described going to Wendy's house the day after Danny was injured. Demko said that when she arrived, she found Wendy with two friends she'd never met before or heard of. Wendy immediately said to Tamara, I'm so sorry. This statement would seem to be acknowledging that Tamara was very close to Danny and genuinely cared about him. It also feels like Wendy may have been inadvertently admitting that Danny's death was more upsetting for Tamara 
than it was for her. This is me speculating, by the way. Tamara didn't say that. Tamara also told the investigator in 2014 that Wendy's two friends, whom she'd never met before, seemed to be acting like bodyguards for her, which struck Tamara as very odd. And as that was going down, Danny's two young sons were running around the house without a care in the world not completely surprising given their young ages. They probably had no idea what had happened. Donna and Harvey Adelson were also at Wendy's house. While Donna, according to Tamara, seemed genuinely upset, Harvey Adelson gave Tamara a bad feeling. Demko said that she's not sure, but she may have given him a look of anger and suspicion. And ever since that moment, she said in 2014, he's been unable to look at me. This makes it sound like Tamara had a gut feeling that Harvey may have been involved in the crime or at least had knowledge of it, which is also a crime, by the way. This is me speculating, however, Harvey has not been charged, not yet. Demko also found it strange that Wendy's brother Charlie did not attend the memorial. At his trial, Charlie said he didn't go, because he was too upset. But now that he's been convicted for playing an integral role in the crime, it's clear Charlie just couldn't deal with having to put on a somber face and pretend like he cared or that he was upset and that he had no idea who could have done this. I wonder what Charlie would have been like had he been at the memorial. Sweaty? jittery? Would he have hung out away from the crowd? Would he have taken a Xanax before the memorial? In 2014, at this point in her interview with the cops, Demko blurted out that she didn't believe any of the Adelsons actually pulled the trigger. She was saying, in not so many words, that she believed the Adelsons were behind the crime, but had found someone else to do the dirty work. How right Demko was. She solved the crime in that moment, but it would take two more years to discover Siegfredo Garcia, and Luis Rivera and their roles in the crime, and then even more years to get the evidence proving Charlie Adelson's involvement and now Donna Adelson's alleged involvement as well. Until the next time on Bed Crime Stories. Hey, smash that like button, let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.